good to see you here tonight. Would you stand as we worship the Lord together? Come on, let's put those hands together.
of acclamation and take me home with joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration in this
Amen. And let's pray, God, we thank you, Lord, for sending your son, Lord, for redeeming this world, for redeeming our hearts. Lord, I pray that we put our trust in you, Lord, we put our faith in you, Lord, that you grow us to be more like you. Lord, we give this time to you. God, I pray that you will be glorified in everything that happens here. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Christian nationalism is not Christianity. What is Christian nationalism? Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism. Violent Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is crying out for a reality check. Is it loving your family? Is it going to church? Is it praying for America? Is it a denomination, a policy, a political party? Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism. In their minds, they've been sort of put on earth by God to form this country into a certain kind of Christian country, whether the majority wants to or not. The rise of the term Christian nationalism. Where did it come from and why is it being used? Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cornerstone Chapel. And welcome to our online viewers, too. I'm Gary Hamrick, the pastor here, along with one of my great friends, the president of Family Research Council, Tony Perkins, everybody. Tony, good to have you with us. It is great to be back at Cornerstone for this Pray, Vote, Stand town hall meeting, Christian nationalism. Has anybody heard of that term? Well, tonight we're going to explore the origins of that term. Why is it being used? Is there a reason that we're hearing that every time we turn on the television? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think it's because they like you, Gary. Well, I think or it's you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. you didn't have to say that. You well, hurt my feelings. Sorry. Look, I, in fact, I was reading this morning in our journey through the Bible. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and Jehoshaphat was being surrounded by this huge army, the overwhelming army. And I thought about where we are today in America. A lot of Christians are discouraged, and a lot of these terms are, as you'll see and hear tonight, are designed to discourage us and cause us to step back. And you know what Jehoshaphat said as he prayed? He said, you know, we have no power against such a vast multitude right. yeah. and we don't even know what to do but our eyes are on you yeah. oh lord that's right and and i think what is at the heart of this pastor gary is that the world is trying to turn our eyes away from the source of our strength yeah. and cause us to hide our faith in the lord jesus christ and i'm here to tell you tonight that as followers of jesus christ no matter what label might be assigned to it we can never back away from the source of our strength yeah that's right well said. And, and in the process, um, there are people who are intentionally trying to intimidate the church. Yes. Intimidate Christians, make us think that we are the haters and the bigots, and, you know, and so we, it's just an attempt to marginalize us. They want you to sit it out. They don't want you to be engaged. So this is, I hope, tonight going to be a time to just encourage you all and to just remind you that as followers of Jesus, it's okay to vote your values, it's okay to pray and ask the Lord because, you know, what does the Bible say? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So we love our country, but we love Him supremely, and so we just want to influence our country for the glory of God. Absolutely. Yeah. So our goal tonight, and by the way, for those that are joining us online, uh, if you're online, you'll see uh, some poll questions will come up as well as a way for you to ask questions. And that goes for everyone here tonight. In just a, a little bit, I will put up a, co a QR code on the screen and you can take that and uh, put, so get your phone ready, not just yet, but get it ready soon. And that way you can ask questions. It's gonna be interactive tonight. So after we hear from our speakers, they're each gonna give a, a short presentation and then we're gonna have a panel discussion. We're gonna take your questions because our goal tonight is for you to be able to, to take what is happening around you, understand why it's happening, and how to respond to it. Because as Pastor Gary said, we have a responsibility. I think in America as Christians, or as, as Americans, we have a right to vote. But as Christians, I believe we have a responsibility to vote right. and to vote biblical values. Yeah. And I believe a lot of what is taking place is designed to suppress the vote 
of Christians. And so what we have to do is overwhelm them at the polls by making sure we not only vote, but we register other Americans to vote legally in this country yeah. and to cast their vote. Did votes. you have to say legally? Like, well, we're, like, we're like living in a day where you have to say that. Well, yeah. because there's some on the other side that don't yeah. do it legally, that's right. but yeah. that's another town hall meeting. Yeah, yeah. So Pastor Gary, why don't you, uh, why don't you open us? It's pray, vote, stand, and so we're gonna be praying tonight, but let's yeah. start. We've worshiped the Lord, now let's pray and commit this night to Him. Let's do that. Lord, we thank you for this time we can gather here in your house. And Lord, we just love you supremely. And we love our families. And we love our country. And we're just thankful to be American citizens of the greatest and freest country. And we just want to be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us. And we, we Lord, want to be encouraged because it is easy to become discouraged in our world today as we seem to be having to just kind of swim against the current. And so, Lord, strengthen our hearts tonight. We pray that you be glorified in all things. We pray for our nation. We pray for, our, for kings and all those in authority. So every elected leader, whether we voted for him or her or not, we pray for them, Lord. And we ask you to just be glorified in all that is said and done here tonight. And we're grateful in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Before I introduce our first speaker, can I just say I, I love your pastor here at Cornerstone. It's mutual, bro. You, you guys have a wonderful pastor. I am encouraged by his courage. And he's courageous in part because you stand with him. Now, he would be courageous even if he was standing alone, but I'm glad he's not alone. And he's got a, an entire church that's standing with him. Yeah. So thank you for praying Amen. for your thank pastor. You their family, and for standing firm for truth here at Cornerstone Chapel. We're Amen. grateful for Amen. you. Amen. Thank you, Tony, and you as well. Well, to begin our evening, we're going to hear from a historian and a nationally recognized expert on religious freedom. Dr. Mark David Hall is the Herbert Hoover Distinguished Professor of Politics at George Fox University. He is also a senior fellow at Baylor University's Institute for Study of Religion. He has written, edited, or co-edited a dozen books on religion and politics in America. I thought those were two topics you're not supposed to talk about, religion and politics. Well, he has uh, written one, and it's called, Did America Have a Christian Founding? That's controversial today. His next book, which will be released next spring, is entitled Proclaim Liberty Throughout All the Land, How Christianity Has Advanced Freedom and Equality for All Americans. I'll tell you, if we ever have a Pray, Vote, Stand book club, we'll start with his collection. Tonight, he's here to lead us in exploring the origins of the term Christian nationalism. Please welcome Dr. Mark David Hall. Well, thanks to the Family Research Council and the Robertson School of Government for hosting this event. I literally would have done it anywhere, but I was thrilled when I heard that it was going to be at Cornerstone Chapel. My um, brother-in-law and sister-in-law are members here, their family worships here, and we have thus worshiped here on multiple occasions when we've come to visit. And I just am always blessed by the musical worship. I love your pastor's preaching. You all have a great church, and thank you for hosting this tonight. So if you look at the history of the term Christian nationalist, what you will find is prior to 2006, no one was using it. Not literally no one, but it was rarely used, and it wasn't used as it's used today. We should be clear about this. Christians were not running around calling themselves Christian nationalists. Christians were not saying we need to advocate for Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism came about really about 2006 as a term of criticism written by people that were highly critical of what they described as a toxic mix, Americans who wanted to conflate God and country. But that's not all. They're racist, they're sexist, they're militarist. Think of almost every ism or is that you don't like, and that is Christian nationalism. Now these early books, a few were written by academics, most were written by popular authors or activists or polemicists who work for places like the Freedom From Religion Foundation. That should maybe give a, a, a hint as to where some of these are coming from. 
and they make some ridiculous arguments. I, I, I document some of these, I'll just mention one now. Many of them attribute Christian nationalism to the work of an obscure Calvinist theologian, Rusash Rashtuni, whom almost no one has heard of, who influenced almost no one. Now they like him because he does say, he's a post-millennialist, he says the kingdom of God will advance, and when it advances, societies will become Christian, and they will adopt biblical law. And in these societies, homosexuals will be put to death if they engage in homosexual activity. Men will dominate the church and the state. Um, incorrigible juvenile delinquents will be put to death, right? Drawing from Levitical, Levitical passages. And so this makes, that sounds really scary, right? Even for Christians, who would want to live in this sort of society? Well, one problem is it's pretty easy to document, and I do this in a publication that will be linked tonight. Really, no one follows Rush Dooney. There are a few thinkers that are influenced by a little bit, but really not at all. So these are the, this is a flavor of arguments. Now, this in 2006 began the um, a, a, a dribble of books that, that, that came out every couple of years, an article, a book would come out. Things escalated with the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol building. This is, if you follow that at all, Christian nationalists have attacked the U.S. Capitol building. I was flying um, back from a speaking engagement on January 6, and I got a, um, a, a message from a reporter who wanted a, a, a comment on the Christian images uh, among the rioters at the Capitol riot. And I said, well, I've been flying. Send me some. She sent me about five images. Three of them were literally 1.5 miles from the U.S. Capitol. There was a rally that day where Christians came together and prayed to overturn the results of the election, as is their constitutional right. Um, they had some signs and crosses and this sort of thing. They were not necessarily among the rioters. There were far more people there than at the rioters. Well, if you turn to the actual riot, you have the Evergreen State, the Pine Street, Pine State flag which says on it, an appeal to God. Well, that sounds kind of Christian, and it could be from judges, but it could also be from Locke's second treaties. Or they could have brought it because it's a revolutionary era flag. The only distinctively Christian photo that they had from the actual riot was a, a, a goth holding a Bible in front of it in front of the rioters. And so I said to the reporter, you might want to be careful with this narrative. You really haven't sent me much by way of images. She completely ignored my caution. And the headline the next day in the Sojourners Magazine article, but everywhere, is again, Christian nationalists have attacked the U.S. Capitol building. If you look at the images from that day, what you will see is a sea of American flags, a sea of MAGA hats, a Confederate flag, a crazy Viking dude. And there eventually it did come out, a Christian flag was there, and a few other images are there. There was a prayer set in the Capitol. So there were certainly some Christians there who thought they were acting as God would have them act, presumably. They weren't. Let's be crystal clear about that. Attacking the U.S. Capitol building, attacking anything really, is never acceptable. Well, since January 6th, and before that, uh, 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 some more serious books have started to come out by academics, people like Andrew Whitehead, Samuel Perry, Phil uh, Gorski, Paul Miller, and others. Now, I take these to be scholars acting in good faith, attempting to measure the phenomenon of Christian nationalists. Now, like the earlier authors, they describe a toxic mix racism, sexism, militarism. This is a horrible, scary thing. And I'm kind of terrified if there are, in fact, Americans out there who hold those views. And unfortunately, I'm afraid we all know that there are. I would like to think, and I'm pretty sure it's a really tiny number in rural parts of, you know, other parts of the country. So I won't say what part of the country because I don't want to insult any particular region. But they came up with a measure, a way of measuring this, where they concluded that, in fact, 52% of Americans are either fully supportive or partially supportive of this horrible, toxic stew that we call Christian nationalism. Now, this is a scary finding. If over half of American citizens are fully or partially supportive of Christian nationalism, we may be in trouble. Fortunately, uh, their measures are fundamentally flawed. They're really good at measuring whether or not one is a strict separationist. So the questions they utilize involve things like, should religious uh, memorials be permitted on public land? In other words, should the Blandensburg Cross in Maryland, this World War Era Cross, be permitted? Or should it be torn down, like the American Humanist Association 
wanted to do. Should the Ohio Holocaust Memorial be permitted to have a Star of David, or should this be pro prohibited as a Freedom From Religion Foundation argument? So are you in favor of the strict separation of church and state? Should prayers be allowed in public schools, or should public schools presumably ban prayers? So again, it's, it's just a very bad set of measures to measure this horrible toxic stew that we call Christian nationalism. I think, and again, I want to, I want to assume the authors are acting in good faith, but there, there's a few lines throughout the book that I think kind of give away the biases, implicit or otherwise. If you are pro-life, you are concerned merely with controlling women's bodies. I wonder if the women in you here who are pro-life know this. And women are just as likely to be fully pro-life as men. I think you could be the most pro-choice American in the entire world and still understand that pro-lifers are concerned with protecting innocent human life. Now, you might think they're wrong, but to accuse them of simply being interested in controlling women's bodies is just wrong. Or they say, um, these Christian nationalists are attempting to define religious liberty as something more than the freedom of worship. Well, this is news to me as a student of the First Amendment, which begins, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The First Amendment has always, religious liberty has always meant something more than freedom to worship. We have the freedom to act upon our religious convictions whenever possible. Of course, there are appropriate limits put on this. You don't get to sacrifice a child to the sun god, but we have the freedom to act. And yet, according to Whitehead and Perry, if you try to defend a more robust understanding of religious liberty, you're a bigot. And of course, what they have in mind is Jack Phillips and Baron L. Stutzman and other Christian creative professionals who refuse to participate in same-sex wedding ceremonies. All right, so I think these measures are bad. Now, fortunately, not all sociologists are the same. There are a couple of sociologists at Pennsylvania State that have come out with a recent article, a, um, a, a Smith and Adler, I think the names are, which I think have a much more reasonable, I think Christian nationalism is a thing. I'm not going to have to time to describe what it is. I assure you, it's not this horrible, toxic mix that is described by the critics of Christian nationalism. But Christian nationalism does exist, and it is embraced by maybe 20% of the American population. We can perhaps talk about that a little later. Let me re mention recently, over the last year, for the first time, Christians have started coming out and embracing the label of Christian nationalism. Marjorie Taylor Greene, for one. Um, there are a couple of academics whom I know who are good, solid Christians. And I assure you, they are not racist, they are not sexist, they are not militarist. Uh, but they're writing books saying we should embrace Christian nationalism. Let's reclaim Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is a good thing. And I understand what they mean. Um, and again, I assure you, they are not advocating for racism, sexism, uh, the whole nine yards. They are advocating for the importance of the nation state in their international order, the importance of culture, and this sort of thing. I think this is a very imprudent move. Christian nationalism is a concept, it's a term invented by critics. We should not embrace it. We should just simply identify ourselves as Christians. We are Christians, we are followers of Christ. We have an obligation, a God-given obligation, a biblical obligation to be involved in politics, to be involved in the city, to be fighting for justice, liberty and freedom for all. That's our obligation, and we cannot fall away from it. But we cannot embrace this term of Christian nationalism that's just imprudent, and it's handing victories to our critics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hall. And uh, now would be the time when you can take out your phone, if you would like. And we're going to have a poll question. And so you'll see a QR code that will be on the screen if you want to take a picture of that. And those of you online have the poll question there for you. Uh, so if we can pull that up on the, uh, the screen, there it is. So go ahead and take a shot, a snapshot of that with your phone. And that'll bring up the link. And you can take the poll question. So everybody got that? All right, if anybody's having trouble, uh, we've got a, a group of five-year-olds in the back that can help you use your smartphone. <laughs> All right, let's see. Can we bring the poll question up on the screen? All right, here it is. What is Christian nationalism? Not certain, but definitely not what the left says it is. A creation of the media, an attempt to intimidate Christians who care about their country or all of the above. So go ahead and take that poll question 
and uh, we will get the results and share those with you. So there's the poll question. Those online, go ahead and take that poll question and it'll all be combined together. All right, to share with us about how the term Christian nationalism is being used is one of the most accomplished men you've probably never heard of. Stephen Coughlin is an attorney. He's a decorated intelligence officer and a specialist on issues as they relate to terrorism and subversion. In September of 2001, Stephen was mobilized with, from his private sector career and assigned to the Directorate for Intelligence with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. As a major in the United States Army Reserve, he was assigned to serve in intelligence and strategic communications. He has been recognized as the Pentagon's leading expert on Islamic law as it relates to national security. Today, he is principal of Unconstrained Analytics, which is a 501c3 dedicated to analysis of evidence unconstrained by preconceptions and biases. I'll repeat that. That's what the media used to do. Uh, it is, he is dedicated to the analysis of the evidence unconstrained by preconceptions and biases. Sounds like the perfect guy to unpack for us how words and labels can be and are being used for a particular end. Please welcome Stephen Coughlin. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'd like to say before anything else is, I was in Louis Gohmert's office a couple years ago, and he has a little thing that memorializes the treaty between America and Britain at the end of the Revolutionary War. And you know who the witness of that document was in writing? The Holy Spirit. So the question that people have to ask themselves, I mean, I grew up, I think we all grew up, God and country. And when did that stop being the rule? And why did it stop being the rule? And how did it get so far? What I'm gonna do, what I do in Unconstrained Analytics is today we take a look at issues from a political warfare perspective. So this is not gonna be a political analysis. You get that from better people better than me at that. We're not gonna look at it theologically because um, that's not my area here at all. But we are gonna say, if we were looking at this like we looked at a foreign country, how would we define it? And we're gonna run with it. So political warfare is the Maoist insurgency model. And our position is that is the dominant form of the left that occupies the United States right now. As relates to this discussion, what I really want to point out is that one of the things that exist, if you read the books at colleges or universities about critical race theory or intersectionality, you read too much. And what we want to do is get people to understand it's much more simple, but if you really understood how simple it was, you would simply know how to fight back. So what is intersectionality? That is to take a value, a value that it's held in a culture. Okay? And they're going to create, make up a phony term. And then they're going to give that term every negative attribute they can come up with that they're focusing. So patriotic Christians will become now Christian nationalists. And it will be defined negatively. And the point will be in the media to collide the one with the other in what would be called in, in the language of Marxism and negation. And it's as simple as that. So what they do is they create these intersectional lines of operation. Black Lives Matter, what does that do? It attacks on race. LGBT says that we demand that you accept our metaphysical claim of gender over the scientifically verified fact in biology of sex. That's what this is all about. And it's all about intimidating people. They don't care that they get their fellow travelers to say, you know, LGBTQ and let their children go to a litter box in a school. They have won in their mind when they got you to accept it by not doing anything about it. So what I'm going to do is instead of over engineering all of this, I'm just going to take things that they have said, and I'm going to focus on Jamar Tisby and Bob Roberts because they're, they're some of the leading voices in this. And I want so you to know how they define it in their own words. Is that fair enough? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just kind of go across the leading piece there and when a percentage of the people here lift their heads up, we'll go to the next slide, fair enough? 
So Christian nationalism is an information campaign to not designed to synchronize with January 6th narratives, the January 6th narrative. Reading these Twitter feeds, three things will emerge. One, they say what they think, so you really don't have to assess what they're saying at this level of analysis. Two, they're broadcasting it openly through Twitter and in the media. We're seeing that. And three, the little political warfare point, is they are so confident that they're in charge, they're engaging what's called open communication. They're not worried that you underheard what they said, because they're reasonably confident that even if you understood what they said was not right, you're not going to know quite what they meant. So here's, here's, that was, so here's one on um, Jamar Tisby, and I'll just let you read that. It has to do with January 6th. And now we'll move to the next one. It directly attacks American Christians for being American Christians, for being politically active. As such, it's an attack on identity. It denies your right to say that you're an American, that you're a Christian. Think about it. LGBT says you're not allowed to call yourself a woman if you're a woman, or a man if you're a man. When you add up all these intersectional lines of attack, they have destroyed your, your ability to call yourself a person. And that is the objective. So, Christian nationalism is also designed to synchronize with the New York Times 1619 project. The objective, to alienate and disenfranchise Christians from their own history. Do you think that's kind of happening? You now have to take classes in a place like a church to find out what your American history is anymore. And your kids are being told something that gets them so spun up, you can't even talk to your kids. That's not a... That is an outcome. Whether directly or indirectly, the Christian nationalism narrative is designed uh, to tie into Marxist critical race theory efforts that identify all American institutions as racists. As noted, it's an intersectional line of effort. And of course, these are their own words. The narrative is, is delegitimizing along Christian lines. Reverend Roberts and his multi-faith neighbors network has powerful international tie-ins. Roberts likens American Christians to a grifting class of money changers at the temple. If I'm going too fast, just, just say, the, the goal is to see what they're saying in their own words. Suggesting that Christians who defend themselves, the institutions they created, of their values and their way of life is unchristian for that reason. Suggesting that Christians do have, su suggesting that Christians do not have a right to defend themselves and their way of life. Implying maybe with cause that Republican leadership is just as ancient and alienated from its own base as is the left. After all, Reverend Roberts', Roberts Multi-Faith Neighbors Network appears to have Lincoln Project tie-ins. We had to break this graphic into two. So there's the one, Holiday, Ambassador, and here he is with the Lincoln Project. And not just a little support from the White House. For Tisby, the people who created the American Republic are America's greatest threat to America's republic, precisely because they don't want to make it a democratic, by which I mean Marxist, republic. America's Christian roots are being reduced to mythologies, a first step in delegitimizing a people's history in furtherance of disenfranchising them from it. Remember, the total separation of you from your own identity. Gaslighting the values of American Christians based on assumptions that are then turned into facts and then declared erroneous. Watch the kind of the weasel language, perceived. We perceive that they do this, but the rest of the sentence is treated as if it's a fact to attack you. appears to be unmoored from traditional Christian ideals. 
Do you see that at the bottom of Tisby's attacks? This is Jamar Tisby. They're really gaslighting campaigns. There's nothing to them. Accusations based on manufactured perceptions, consequentialist. What do they mean by that? They'll do anything to win. Clearly, America's Christians are dangerously untethered and are tilting to extremism, a clear indicator of downstream terrorism. And this feeds into the violent extremism narrative that was put into place going way back that we had many battles with. Do you remember that? This is how the violent extremism narrative is going to come into play. And it won't be used against bin Laden in Iraq. It's designed to be used against you. So, simply paranoid and undone. That's, that's you, isn't it? Just take a look at yourself. When Christians mobilize politically to defend their constitutionally protected way of life, it's described in covert conspiratorial terms. Again, gaslighting. And lest the gaslighting campaign is not clear enough, beneath every Christian nationalist is a seething racist seeking to seek revenge upon an unsuspecting population. I had to break this in two so you see that Tisby's message was about a little child who, you know, wants to grow up and, and chew people. Of course, that's just the message. I just think it's really important for you to get a sense for how these people communicate this in their own words so you can get a feel for it because it's a little slick. You can easily say, well, I was only talking about perceptions. Maybe I'll change my mind. And what he's really saying is I'm going to have to up my game. And with that, I would, like to, I would like to thank everybody for your time, and I hope this was helpful. Thank you, Stephen. And I know that you're already thinking of some questions, so go ahead and write those questions down, because in a moment I'm going to give you a means by which you can ask those questions when we get into our panel discussion, because we're getting a lot of information, and we're going to be unpacking that as we go through our evening. Now, I, I want to give you the results of our poll thus far, those that have taken it uh, in terms of our question, what is Christian nationalism? 74% say it's all of the above. 19% said it's an attempt to intimidate Christians who care about their country. 3% not certain, but definitely not what the left says it is. Uh, you're always safe saying that. It's never what the left says it is. And 3% said it is a creation of the media. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, and we're building up to this understand why is this happening? There is an outcome that they want, but I'm going to get a jump on it because I want to challenge you to take the Pray, Vote, Stand pledge, the pledge to pray, to pray for our nation, to pray for the upcoming elections, pledge to vote your biblical values, and then take the pledge to stand for biblical truth no matter what people say, no matter what they put on social media, no matter what label they assign to it, that you will stand for truth. So I want you guys to put that, that uh, slide back up there. All you need to do is text the word pledge to 67742 and take the pledge to pray, vote, and stand. And so for those of you joining us online, you can do the same. Text the word pledge to 67742, pledge to pray for our nation, the upcoming elections, to vote your biblical values, and to stand for biblical truth. Well, the Family Research Council is blessed to have an incredible board of directors led by our chairwoman, Michelle Bachman. In addition to being a former congresswoman and presidential candidate, uh, Michelle is a genuine prayer warrior, intensely committed to interceding for our nation and for our leaders. And last year, she took on a new assignment as the dean at Regent University's Robertson School of Government. And uh, we're grateful here at the Family Research Council and Quarterstone Chapel for the opportunity to partner tonight with Regent uh, for this special town hall event. Uh, Regent is, a, an incredibly, uh, is an incredible educational institution, and I'm very thankful that they, under Michelle's leadership, are dedicated to uh, pursuing clarity and intellectual honesty in uh, these issues that challenge us today. 
to help shine the light on the political intentions behind the term Christian nationalism, please welcome to the stage Michelle Bachman. Tony, thank you. Pastor Gary, thank you so much for opening up this beautiful church that reminds me of an Aspen ski lodge every time I come here. It's so beautiful. But I want to also thank Dr. Uh, Mark David Hall, who gave the wonderful remarks on what academia is saying about this issue. And also my very good friend, Dr. Steve Coughlin, who gave me a lot of briefings when I was in the United States Congress and understands deeper beneath the surface because he looks and at what people really say about issues. The reason why we're here tonight is because some of us had noticed that there was something happening in the culture and it was aimed at all of you. It was aimed at the church, it was aimed at pastors. And it was aimed at the church because the church has been doing something right. And believers have been doing something right. Pastors, like the pastor of this church, has taken on the whole counsel of God and preaches the whole counsel of God freely and bravely from the pulpit. That's right. We want to see more of that. And that means the issues of the day in our own culture, whatever culture we live in. The Bible has something to say about every issue in every culture. And this church has not been afraid, together with other pastors in other churches, prior to elections or before elections or with no thought of elections, they've been trying to preach what the Word of God says. This is a good thing. Too many pastors have been frightened into silence. They maybe didn't have a board of directors that would back them. They maybe thought their congregants wouldn't like it if they talked about the issues of the day. But when we do that, when the church goes silent, bad things happen. Bad things happened in the 1930s when the church in Europe went silent. When that church went silent, it took a very young theologian named Bonhoeffer who saw what was happening in his own nation in Germany and he had to stand up within the Lutheran church and stand for what is true and against the scapegoating that was coming against one particular group of people, the Jewish people in Germany. Ultimately, Bonhoeffer paid for his advocacy with his life, which he happily did. Happily, I say, because he wanted to be obedient before God because he saw in his culture, he gave some of the most astounding messages to the clergy of his day, telling them, don't go silent. Wake up. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen in Germany and in Europe. And as we all know, the lights went out in Europe. Europe has never been the same since World War I and World War II, because the church went silent. You see, it's highly consequential when the word of God is pervasive in a nation. Like Pastor Gary said, that nation is blessed whose God is the Lord. When we preach that whole counsel, when the people know my people perish for lack of knowledge. And what does a godly pastor do? What does a godly church do? They inform the faithful and they inspire the faithful to bring biblical values into their own lives, into their family's life, into their business's life, into their community's life, into the political life of the nation. And that is how a nation can, have, can be a nation that serves the Lord because it understands the Lord. It isn't just behind these beautiful church doors. It's not meant for just behind these, be these beautiful church doors. The values of the church are meant for the community, for the nation, for the public, for those who don't yet know or understand that there is a loving God who has a plan for every person on this planet. That is why the church <laughs> preaches. 
And we've had so many wonderful churches that have. You see, we had ch pastors and churches that woke up profoundly prior to the 2016 election. And they were preaching faithfully for almost 50 years about the issue of the value of the unborn. Since the Roe versus Wade decision, the church understood intuitively what the Bible said, that we are made in the image and likeness of a holy God. And so pastors preached on that topic. People became informed. They understood. And they voted biblical values. And because they voted biblical values, ultimately presidents were elected who appointed Supreme Court justices who now in this last year, as we have seen in the Dobbs decision, issued a decree that the Roe versus Wade decision after 50 years of contending would be overturned. And so now that decision goes to the 50 states. And so now it is no longer Roe versus Wade in the nation. That came about through prayer. It primarily came about because of faithful pastors who were preaching. You see, we were very effective. I want to put the first slide up right now. So effective were Christians in going to the polls uh, that people who were spiritually active and governmentally engaged turned out in the 2016 election when they knew it was Donald Trump. They weren't sure about Donald Trump. They were very sure about Hillary Clinton. And so 91% of people who were spiritually active and governmentally engaged turned out and they gave a chance to Donald Trump in that election primarily because of the Supreme Court appointments. If, if you notice in 2016, 60% of the general public turned out. 91% or 9% of the American population got out and voted and made their vote count. Because of that vote in 2016, we had the result of overturning Roe versus Wade this last year because of that election. In 2020, we saw again those who were spiritually active, governmentally engaged, more than 9% of the population in that year turned out. 99% of those who are spiritually active, governmentally engaged, turned out and voted. And of that amount, 97% voted for Donald Trump. His vote totals went up with those who, who were spiritually active, governmentally engaged. And the national turnout was 67%. You see, when that happened in 2016, there was a decision made by the progressive left, this will never happen again. And so they started this effort to come against those that they saw were thwarting their plans to turn this nation into something more akin to Mao, more akin to communism. They're trying to fundamentally transform the United States and throw out the traditional history and understanding of who we are. They're very intentionally about this. They're very intentional. This is a very much a plan that they're trying to do. And they see that what is standing between them and victory is the church. The church and faithful pastors and believers who take biblical values into the voting booth. I want to show you a video clip right now that demonstrates this. Let's run this video clip. Too much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. <laughs> Donald Trump and the Magna Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. <clears throat> not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know, because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. This was specifically designed and done for the purpose of intimidation. The stage lighting, the Marines that are stationed there, this is per, 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 um, explicitly done to show intimidation, to use the words extremism, the epicenter of that is Christian nationalism, saying that we don't think it's good that you're for your nation. We don't think it's good that you're for God. Very bizarre, but we're the ones that are called extremists. Next clip. 
And here, in my view, is what is true. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. And they're working right now, as I speak, in state after state, to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, empowering election deniers to undermine democracy itself. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards, backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, no right to contraception, no right to marry who you love. They promote authoritarian leaders and they fan the flames of political violence that are a threat to our personal rights, to the pursuit of justice, to the rule of law, to the very soul of this country. If you stand for natural marriage, you're an extremist, according to the president. If you stand for biological truth, you're an extremist to the president. And if you stand for the rights of the unborn, you're an extremist to the president. So it's a mental jujitsu that they're trying to do. They're trying to exchange what extremism is and make those of us who believe in biblical values the extremists. One more clip, and then we'll move on. Michael Ludwig has called Trump and the extreme MAGA Republicans, quote, a clear and present danger to our democracy. But while the threat to American democracy is real, I want to say as clearly as we can, we are not powerless in the face of these threats. We are not bystanders in this ongoing attack on democracy. There are far more Americans, far more Americans, from every, from every background and belief, who reject the extreme MAGA ideology than those that accept it. So do you see the scapegoating that's going on? He's creating a group of people that he calls MAGA Republicans, but the other people that we're seeing in the media are using the term Christian nationalism. That's the epicenter of the people that they want everyone else to look at and scapegoat as the bad guy extremists, those who are standing up for biblical values. The rubber is meeting the road because these people hold all the reins of power in Washington, D.C., and they want to continue holding on to that power. You think they don't mean this? Look at the FBI raids that have happened in just the last few weeks, where our FBI has been unleashed by the Department of Justice on who? Pro-life fathers who have been praying at abortion clinics and who have been singing at abortion clinics and the FBI shows up with AR-15s and with uh, the body armor and knocking down the door and pointing guns at the little kids, this is for intimidation. That's why we have to wake up in the church and realize we cannot allow ourselves to be intimidated in this moment of time. That's what they're trying to do. And if you'd put up the next slide, please. If you'd put up the next slide. There's a brand new book that I read this weekend that I listened to on Audible. I commend this for every pastor in the United States to read this book, A Letter to the American Church. Eric Metaxas is seeing what's going on in our country with this level of intimidation, and he's pleading with pastors, please don't go silent. Please speak out. Thank God Cornerstone Chapel is one of those churches. We need to pray that there are more like that. And with the next slide, I'll conclude. And this is a wonderful book that has been written by Pastor Jim Garlow. For those pastors who would like to be able to preach on these biblical topics but don't know how, this book is meant for pastors to know be well-versed on what the scripture says about the issues of the day. And I want to thank this church, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. All right, any questions? <laughs> well, that's why we're here. It's a town hall meeting. By the way, how many are going to make a commitment that I will not be intimidated? 
I will not shrink back into the silence. I will not hide in the shadows. I will boldly speak and stand on the truth. And I want to encourage you again if, to take that pledge to pray, vote, and stand. Text the word pledge to 67742. And those of you who are joining us from across the country, I challenge you as well to take that pledge to pray, vote, and stand. All right, I'm going to ask our, all of our speakers to come up here and join me on the stage for our panel discussion. And I'm also going to ask our AV team to put up the QR code on the screen so that you can... Uh, you guys can join me up here, it's, it's all right. <laughs> I think they're afraid she's gonna play more clips of the president. It's okay, it's all right. It's, yeah, no more trigger warnings. Uh, Thank you. Oh, this is cute. So if you'll put that QR code up there, you can take a snapshot of that. It'll take you to a link and you can put your question in and we will be taking your questions here as we enter into our time of discussion. So I'm gonna begin I think I, I must have done something wrong. I'm over here by myself, but that's okay. I am to everyone's right, so that's appropriate. <laughs> good one, good think one, again. Tony. Yeah. yeah, think again. Look who's on my left. <laughs> You're getting pretty close to me there, Gary. I, actually, I'm going to start with you, Pastor Gary. As we've seen this and we've heard from the academics, we've heard you know, how this term is being used, why it's being used. So let's talk now about as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, as those who believe the Bible and believe that the Bible is the guidebook for life through which we get our guidance, how should we as Christians be responding? Should we avoid conflict and shrink back and go away like they would like us to? You know, what's, what's so tragic about all this is we're talking about terminology today because you know, to, to be patriotic, um, they're conflating with this, you know, term that now makes everybody who just wants to be, you know, uh, a Christian who wants to vote your values appear to be extreme and appear to be, you know, somebody who's so far right that um, you shouldn't have a voice. So, as Christians, we need to know who we are in Christ and we need to just, you know, stand in that identity in Christ. And we need to continue to be men and women and young people who espouse the, the principles of God's Word. And we, we just have to get a little more tender-hearted and thick-skinned because people are going to try to intimidate you. They're going to try to accuse you. But, you know, Jesus said, blessed are you when men, you know, despise you, accuse you, say all manner of evil against you uh, uh, for my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. So we have to keep that focus and remember that we're serving the Lord and what people say, let them say it, but we want to ultimately glorify Him. We have no other option. Yeah. Can I, can I just add one thing real quickly because there's a clip that Michelle didn't play that struck me because I watched it live when, when the President gave that speech and at the very end he talked about the soul of America. Yeah. Yeah. He mentioned the soul of America and it reminded me of and some are going to lambast me for how dare you compare. But I'm just saying historically, Hitler talked about the soul of Germany. And um, it, in, in the early 1940s, Hitler gathered the clergy in Berlin, and he told them about how with, with him in charge, their, their uh, subsidies would stay intact because you know, they were state churches. And Bonhoeffer was one who stepped forward and said, uh, Herr Hitler, we're not concerned for the church because Jesus Christ will take care of her, of her church, of, uh, of the church. What we are concerned about is the soul of Germany, and th that's when Hitler said, I will take care of the soul of Germany. It's the, it's, it's the right and privilege and duty and responsibility and honor of the church of Jesus Christ to take care of the soul of America in the sense that we have the gospel, which is the only good news that heals the soul of America or any country. Uh, Stephen, uh, I want to go to you for, for a moment. Uh, as uh, Michelle was talking about the church played a very influential role in the elections uh, because, you know, we gather together and when you have pastors who preach about the issues in the Bible and how it applies to the world in which we live, Christians act on that. But we see something happening. It's not just the left 
that is marginalizing or using these labels. We see it coming from the media as well. We're seeing that there is this effort to cut off national discussion from certain segments of society. How do we deal with that and what is their ultimate objective? I think one of the things we're trying to build out is everything we're seeing is not random. It's not in the air. So there's something called semantic Marxism and part of semantic Marxism is something called um, discourse theory. And discourse theory has a large explanation, but basically at the end of the day, it means we get to get up and say what we want and we get to turn the mic off on you. Yeah. And I think that we have to understand that that is a specific line of attack and that we have to organize to, to push back that attack. You know, one of the, th the reasons I kept going to my phone is I wrote something that Michelle said and I wanted to make sure I didn't forget it. But you know, one of the things I thought was very interesting is I think it was right before Biden talked about uh, the MAGA uh, conservatives were the most dangerous threat to America. I think that a certain, you know, faux chair of the uh, January 7th hearing had her dad say the exact same thing. But what we do know is that when Cheney said that the MAGA Republicans were the greatest threat to America, Within a week, we saw the raid at Mar-a-Lago. And I just can't help myself thinking that there were, we're looking at something just a little more synchronized, a little bit bigger than just the left, although I think that that's an extremely bad thing. So, Michelle, you, you have thoughts on that? Well, I'd like to just add to what uh, Steve was saying. I was actually at the Capitol on January 6th. I was there with a group of believers. We were praying. We were just out on the lawn. We were praying that day. And it was probably one of the happiest days. It was like a family reunion. It was like a picnic. The people were so happy. It wasn't angry. It wasn't violent. It wasn't any of those things. And I remember distinctly thinking when I was there that this was planned, that this was insurgents that were in here. I, this is in real time. That's what I thought. Because we, we were just praying for peace. We were just there praying, praying for the nation, because the nation was in an uproar. And I distinctly remember that, thinking this was a branding exercise. They wanted, because we just had a very popular president get more votes uh, in 2020 than he got in 2016. He got more votes. People went out and voted en masse. And his agenda was wildly popular. You know, gasoline was $1.89 a gallon. That was pretty popular. So, <laughs> it, it, yes. So, so this was a rebranding exercise to label the president himself a terrorist or an insurrectionist. It was meant to label his followers or supporters as insurrectionists and the Make America Great Again agenda as a terrorist agenda. And that's a little bit what I was hearing from the president in that speech up there. So this is continuing. This wasn't just a one-off. That's how you knew that January 6th wasn't random. This was intentional, and we're seeing it still today, and that's part of what I think we need to know from this tonight, is just be forewarned, this is going to continue. They're not gonna give up, because when a prior president said, we're gonna fundamentally transform the United States of America, they meant it. That wasn't a political phrase. They want to tr transform. And what they see standing between their goal to, to turn this country into a completely different nation is believers. Mm -hmm. Believers is the epicenter mm -hmm. because we'll stand for something. Something is more important to us yep. than politics. Yep. Yeah. And that's what the Bible says. And we will stand for biblical values yep. no matter what. Yep. I I'm going to go to some questions here. Yeah. I'm going to go to some of our questions from those that are participating in the town hall. But first, I, I, uh, Dr. Hall, I, uh, I guess I want to make a confession of my activity on January the 6th. I was in the office with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo with a group of pastors, and we were praying for the nation. Would that fit the definition of what the left is calling Christian nationalism today? <laughs> You know, it, it might fit some definitions. I'm not sure it exactly fits more academic definitions, but let me, this is a good thing to distinguish, I think, right? Um, I love what Michelle said. As Christians, we have an obligation to bring our faith into the public square, but it starts with us, right? It starts with 
being biblically moral ourselves. It starts with our family. It starts with voluntarily sharing the gospel. It starts with prayer, with praying for the nation, whether with Mike Pompeo or a local Bible study. What it does not involve is having the federal government force people to become Christians. And that's what the critics of Christian nationalism would say Christian nationalists want. And I know almost no Christian, I'm sure you could find some out there that think the federal government should make Christianity the official established religion of the United States and punish people who don't follow Christianity. But they're precious few. So only it's not 52% of the American population. So no praying for the president, praying for the country is not by any meaningful sense Christian nationalism. But they are stretching that term to suggest that any, anyone bringing faith into the public square is advocating for Christian nationalism. It may not be the historic definition, but it's certainly how they're using it. All right, I'm gonna go to some of these questions and, and Pastor Gary, get ready, because most of them are for you. Oh, great. <laughs> First one is, why are you not wearing a tie? Uh, well, <laughs> Well, first of all, Michelle isn't either. Oh, okay. and, uh, and We and, still distinguish between the sexes, though, here, yeah. okay? Yes, we do. I'm the only sensible one, that's all right. why. Okay, all right, moving right along. How do we lovingly challenge pastors who we observe are shrinking back from important and what some would call polarizing social issues? You know, I, I, I get this question often, um, sadly, and uh, I don't know how to lovingly do that. That, you know, that was the key word in your question. How do you lovingly do that? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure Jesus was loving when he called the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs. I think he was and, smiling though. When he was well, saying. he might have said it with a smile. <laughs> but um, I think it's just time that they need to get called out. And I think it's going to take some courageous people to call them out. I, I might... I might add to that is that if you have a, a pastor and you've prayed for him, and I would suggest you pray for him first, yeah. then you talk with him, and then if they continue to avoid the, the issues of our day in terms of applying scripture, then you need to find a church that preaches the whole counsel of God. Yeah, that's right. But, the, but also they can buy Eric Metaxas' book and buy the audible version of it. And by the way, uh, I've been texting with him this week. So he's coming, we're trying to work out a date in November, but he's gonna actually come. We're gonna That's bring so that That's so good. It is yeah. such a good book for pastors. It's yeah. good for us, but it's really good for pastors yeah. to give them to cur the courage why they should do it. Okay, I'm gonna throw this one out here for any of our panelists that would like to uh, handle this one. How do we handle our adult children who are so swayed by this woke agenda? Great question. All right, do you want to answer it? <laughs> who wants to take that one? Do you have a... Well, I, I, would, I would say I have five kids and none of them are swayed by the woke yeah. agenda. Yeah. So I'm extreme. It yeah. started in the I think cradle. It, it, it starts... In the cradle. Train them up as they are young. That's yeah. right. And I, and I do think, look, by the way, I, th there's a lot of truth in that. A worldview is formed between 13 months and 13 years. Mm -hmm. And so as parents, we need to be intentional about teaching our children not Bible stories, but biblical truths. Why do you think the left wants early childhood education? Amen. That's right. They want to give them this woke liberal ideology, this worldview that would steer them away from truth. And so we've got to be intentional. Uh, about that yeah. and, and not be afraid to have these conversations uh, with our, our children. I'm more concerned about my children's eternal destination than I am about mm -hmm. their current pleasure and their desire to feel comfortable in this world. And I think we need to be challenging our children just as we would challenge our pastors mm -hmm. to, to live by and speak the truth. If I am called a Christian nationalist, how should I respond? Um, Dr. Hall, I'll give that one to you. I think a good approach would be to say, what do you mean by a Christian nationalist? Mm -hmm. And if someone's accusing you of that, they might say things like, well, that means you're a racist, you're a sexist, you're, you're a militarist. And then I suppose you could say, well, what, what evidence do you have that I'm any of those things? What actions have I done? What words have I said that would give you reason to believe that I am any of these things? And uh, hopefully it will fall apart. And it might come back, well, you're a Christian who brings your faith into the public square. You argue for the protection of innocent human life. 
And you could say, yes, that's absolutely true. I'm a Christian who argues for moral policies. And let me add this, it, it is sort of funny, even the critics of Christian nationalism do not say no one can bring their faith into the public square. They explicitly praise the civil rights movement, the civil rights leaders, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. If you bring your faith into the public square to argue for something that the left like, likes, and in this case, the right should like as well, right? Civil rights for all, that's appropriate. It's only if you bring your faith into the public square to argue for the sanctity of all human life that you're a Christian nationalist. So we can disambiguate the question and discuss the issues instead of debating a label. That is really good advice. In fact, you know, Jesus would often ask questions when he was challenged with something to get to the heart of the matter because it exposes what they are saying and what they're doing. It's really good uh, advice. So Michelle, I'm gonna go to you with this question. Uh, how do we inspire Christians to vote who feel their vote won't count as they see elections as being rigged? Oh, I think the main thing is we always, whatever we do in life, we're doing it for an audience of one, and that's the Lord. So no matter what, we need to know that we have voted in a way that would honor him. And that's, to me, that's also, it's just part of the way we live our lives. It's part of the way that we worship God. How do we conduct ourselves? Yeah. And the vote is part of it. And I will tell you, just from a political point of view, you can't believe the number of races that are decided literally by one vote. Yeah by one vote. You wouldn't think so, but actually it happens. And so if you look like, for instance, in 2020, I think in Arizona, it was like 10,000 votes separated Biden from Trump, something of that same number in Georgia. So, well, you know, we, we can argue, yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, here I in know. Virginia, but here in Virginia, um, I'm eight, eight years ago or so, maybe a little bit longer, the control of the legislature was decided by one vote. That's right. That's right, that's right here in Virginia. And aren't we glad that we all showed up and voted for the mm -hmm. governor in that's the right. state of Virginia, yeah. Governor Glenn Youngkin. What a great choice. So that's, and Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears. Yeah. Let me add to that, for, for, because I, th there's a lot of people that are feeling like my vote doesn't count. And I, I'm, there were a lot of irregularities in the last election, but I will tell you this, that you've had about 19 states, almost actually bumping up toward two dozen states that have passed election reform measures. They've been working the last two years to address a lot of these issues. And then the other thing I think we need to do, and this is why we're doing the pledge, challenging people to pray, vote, and stand, is that we just have to overwhelm them and, and know that there's probably going to be some cheating on the other side, but we're going to show up in such numbers that it doesn't matter if they steal a few votes or so, we're going to show up and legally win these races by being concerned, being prayed up, and being engaged Amen. as American citizens. You know, Tony, one thing I'd like to mention, we just completed for the second year in a row, 40 days of prayer and fasting mm -hmm. at the Robertson School of Government. We believe very seriously in the power of prayer. So we just completed it. And I read that just today, the Supreme Court overturned a, Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruling so that now errors that are on the ballots, those ballots won't be counted. That was, a, that was part of the rigged election last time right. where they counted ballots that they shouldn't have. The US Supreme Court just ruled today that's not gonna happen. Right. So that's huge victory. So I wanna urge everyone to pray. Pray yourself or get a few people together and, and just, Test God on this. Right. Pray, pray, yeah. and see what He will do. Just a, a note on that: um, a gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, yeah. called his uh, yes. supporters to 40 days of prayer and fasting, mm. and the media used that as evidence that he's a Christian nationalist. <laughs> Look it up. Mm. That's what we're talking about, and that's why we cannot shrink back. Yeah. from these labels that are being assigned. Now, Dr. Hall, I want to go to you for this next question because uh, you touched on this a little bit uh, in your remarks. Uh, this comes from uh, one of our, our viewers. says, the term Christian was originally de uh, derogatory in the Bible. Can we not adopt the term Christian nationalism and turn it to good? You know, I, I'm... Either, you, you take it first and I'm going to let Stephen hit that lick. 
I, I tend to think that when you have a term that is created for the purpose of attacking you, that it doesn't become real till you respond to it. And then once you respond to it, you're captured by it. So everything from that moment forward, there's actually, there's actually a methodology involved in this. It's not just an opinion when I say that. The minute you respond to critical race theory, now that's all you're talking about. And now it's a series of defenses where the entire narrative doesn't admit your right to have a defense. So I, my take on it would be you don't engage at all. You recognize that, that it's an information campaign designed to delegitimize you, and the very response to it in that narrative in any way is itself a defeat. And then you're now, now you're managing the defeat. Dr. Hall? I think it's very, very imprudent. I know some of the people attempting to do this, you know, solid Christians, academics, and the writing books saying we should claim this label. This is a good label. No, it's not. And it has not historically been our label. It's a term of the critics. And I think it's just so polluted that let's just let it, let it, let it be. We're Christians engaging in politics. We're uh, advocating for liberty, justice for all, for all Americans, not just for Christians. And we, we, we just, are not Christian nationalists, and we aren't interested in being called Christian nationalists. Uh, Dr. Colgan, I want to go back to you for a minute on, on s something you were talking about with critical race theory. Um, and, and, and Stephen, it, from a standpoint of critical race theory and how that has mobilized a lot of Americans because they realize what their children were being indoctrinated with. And I mean, right here in Virginia is really kind of the epicenter of that battle over public education. So I want to be clear, you're not saying we shouldn't educate ourselves on what the left is doing with this term Christian nationalism. It's just that we shouldn't adopt their labeling, just as we wouldn't adopt, Christi or we wouldn't adopt CRT as a good uh, curriculum for our children. I think you would say, if I respond by saying, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, racist in the, in the critical race theory, now you're in a defense. That's what I'm talking about. The other way, the, and it, it takes a little time to figure out how to maneuver this space. The other way of saying it, you know, critical race theory is just an attack narrative. We're not going to engage in that. And I'm going to tell you why it's an attack narrative. It comes from this source. This source only exists to delegitimize the people they're going after. And, you know, you build on that. So you basically, you basically the, frame, the, the phrase that's used in, the, in that type of, um, in that type of um, intersectionality attack is reify. Critical race theory meant nothing when they wrote about it. It only meant something when you responded to it, and then the game was on, but you're now in quicksand. Can you win? You Maybe, but you're in the quicksand and they're not. And the other important part about it is they just made it up, so if they lose, they'll go home for a year, come back with a new phrase, and they'll do right. the same attack. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Hall, as the, uh, the historian here on the stage, this question is for you. Was the old Russian empire Christian nationalist where the state was the church and the church was the state? If so, what happened to the church in Russia? You know, this is a fascinating question. I'm actually going to be involved in a couple of panels in Washington, D.C. over the next couple of months with the Mercatus Center, the Institute on Religion and Democracy, where we're inviting scholars from places like Hungary and Poland, um, the Czech Republic, England, France, to talk about Christian nationalism in those countries. Is it similar to what we have in America? Is it um, different? Is it pernicious? Can it be a force for good? I, um, I, I have to admit I'm kind of skeptical that it can be a force for good. I think especially given the history of the term over the last what, 12 or more years, 15, 16 years, where it's only been used, until very recently, it's only been used as something critical of Christians who bring their faith into the public square. I'm not very optimistic, but I'm very interested in learning more. My sense is in Russia, you do have a, a very dangerous conflation of church and state, and in a way that is very entirely unhealthy. I think we've all seen the Russian Orthodox ministers blessing the Russian war machine as it goes into, into combat. And, yeah, that, that, that sort of thing is very troubling, and I hope it's troubling to all of us. Right. Yeah, I think we want to be very clear, and I think I could speak for all of us. We're talking about being Christians in America. Our first allegiance is the kingdom of God, but we're proud to be Americans. I'm grateful that I live in a country where we have freedom, and I've served our country, and I know many in here have served our nation and our military and our law enforcement, and that's nothing to be ashamed of. We want the separation of church and state. We don't want the state meddling in the church's business, which is where that origin of that phrase came from. 
but we're not going to shrink back about bringing our faith in engaging the public square. We cannot check our faith at the door. It's who we are. And I think that ultimately is what the left desires for us to do, is to disengage and to allow their values to dominate the discussion. I want to thank you all for being here. We've got many questions, but we're going to bring our time to a close tonight. And as we do, I'm going to ask each of our panelists just a parting thought as we conclude this evening, and then we're going to close our time in prayer. I'm going to end, uh, begin with you, uh, Michelle, if you'd give us uh, kind of your parting thoughts. Well, Christian nationalism is a pejorative term, a negative term. We need to understand that, but we also need to know that they're very specific. They're going after pastors to encourage pastors don't have Fourth of July services, don't honor and recognize veterans, don't have things about America or America's founding in your country. This is happening at pastors' conferences in different seminaries. So this is happening right now. That's why pastors need encouragement from congregants. It's why I'm recommending Eric Metax's book and Pastor Jim Garlow's book. We need to encourage our pastors to realize America has a wonderful history, a unique godly history. We need to be proud of it and share that with the next generation. Yeah. Stephen? I think what, what we're living in a, a state of, the state we're living in right now is the, the phrase is liquefied reality. There's been an entirely enormous effort to get you to be confused about everything. And in that, in that state of being confused by everything, the Marxists call that demor a demoralization campaign. And people feel demoralized. But it's only a perception. And you're allowing it to, and you're allowing that to govern how you feel. Uh, I think that um, that Christian nationalism is an attack on your identity. It seeks to destroy your identity along with other things. And I think at a certain point, you know, there's a patch for the army basic training, and it says, this we will defend. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to take your guide on, put it in the ground and say, this we will defend. Yeah, amen, very good. <laughs> Dr. Hall. So I've critiqued this notion that 52% of Americans embrace a horrible toxic mix of racism, sexism, militarism, and that sort of thing. In doing that, I in no way, shape, or form mean to suggest that racism is not still a problem in America today, that sexism is not still a problem, that we have other problems such as poverty. I think we as Christians should be first and foremost in addressing these in our own lives, in the lives of our churches, in the lives of our community. Maybe many of these problems are best addressed without political, without political institutions, right? Through churches and voluntary organizations and that sort of thing, to the extent to which government should be involved in addressing these very real problems Christians must have a voice. We must be active in the public square advocating for, for peace, for justice, for liberty, for equality, and equality for all Americans. Mm -hmm. Amen. And to our wonderful host tonight, uh, Pastor Gary, your parting thoughts. You know, unfortunately, a lot of this is a war on words. And um, there's another term that kind of is linked with Christian nationalism, and that's dominionist. Um, and, you know, look, I'm not a dominionist. A dominionist is wanting government to be king, and uh, we know that Jesus is going to come again. When the millennial kingdom is established, then there will be one true king who is over all the earth, and we will worship Jesus. And until that happens, then all we're saying is, Christian, be aware of the war on words. Know what these terms mean, and just live your life serving and loving Jesus, wanting other people to know Jesus, and express your values and let these principles that are governed and guided by God's Word to be influenced in the world instead of the world influencing you. Until that day when Jesus comes again, we are to be salt and light. So be that salt and be that light to this dark and tasteless world. Amen. Amen. Well, when he is king of kings, there will be no elections and there will be no ballot stuffing. So it, will, yeah. it yeah. is a done deal. He will be king of kings and the Lord of lords. Yeah. I want to thank each of you for being a part of this tonight. And I want to thank Regent University. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Pastor Gary, thank you for hosting us here at Cornerstone. Stephen, Dr. Hall, thank you for being here tonight. And I want to thank all of you who have joined us online across the nation. And thank you for being here tonight at Cornerstone and being a wonderful, wonderful town hall uh, gathering for us to discuss what I think is an extremely important issue knowing how we should address it as we go forward. Let's close our time together in prayer. If you would, let's stand together. And let's go to the Lord, our Savior. Father, we thank you for our time here together tonight. And Lord, I pray that there would be a resolve that would come across your people. That Lord, we would not in any form or fashion deny you but we would live our lives in such a way that we would impact the world around us with your truth and with your love. Lord, I pray that you would guard our hearts against any anger or bitterness toward those who would attack and assign labels and try to drive us from our citizenship and our participation in this country. May we love them as you have commanded us to do, but loving them does not mean we affirm what they do. Lord, we love them because they are created in your image and they're worthy of love because they bear your image. But Lord, we do pray for revival in the church in America and an awakening in our culture and a return to truth. And we pray that America would again be a nation that is blessed by you because we obey you. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good night, everyone.